Welcome to episode 250 of Freshly Grounded. Before we show you the show footage, we just want to mention that we're raising money in this episode for orphan sponsorship with Human Appeal. There are an estimated 153 million orphans worldwide and they are some of the most vulnerable members of our society. To contribute towards sponsoring an orphan, head over to the link in our description. Without further ado, I would like to present to you Mr. Faisal Chowdhury. Assalamu alaikum. I'm a nobody. I'm not just saying that because I'm stood in front of a group of people and so I'm trying to act humble. I really am a nobody. I don't really have anything to give. But I'm stood in front of you guys right now. Why? It's not because I'm the most intellectual person here. It's not because I'm a great storyteller. It's not because I'm the most handsome man in the room. I am all of those things, my mum will tell you that, but that's not why I'm stood here today. I'm stood here because there is one thing I have. I think it's something that I would deem a lost medium. And that thing is that I've been able to stand and sit with some of the most elite, intellectual, wealthy, productive, incredible minds for over 250 episodes, over 400 hours of conversation. I've spoken to some amazing people and over time, many of them have also become my friends. And so I could stand here today and tell you guys how we got from zero to 250 episodes and the story of Freshly Grounded, but I'm not going to do that. I want to give you guys something so much more valuable. And what that is, is lessons that I've learned from these people that I've interviewed. Hours of conversation, both on and off camera. Things that I've been able to implement in my life and then take advantage of. And so if I can give that to you guys today, then I think that you'll go home today with perhaps something that can benefit in your professional life, your personal life, perhaps even your spiritual life. So I was going to call this 250 lessons from 250 episodes, but then I thought it would be way too long, especially with the hourly rate of this place. So we've decided to go with top 10 lessons from 250 episodes. And it's probably worth noting now that I used to hate cliches or quotes or idioms or sayings, whatever you want to call them couldn't stand them. Be yourself. Everybody else is taken. Oh, so cheesy. But then I started realizing, as I was doing episodes and people would use these different quotes, I realized that they exist for a reason. They went viral for a reason. Because somebody said them, other people related to them, and they carried it forward. Be the change you wish to see in the world. So true. Just makes you want to kind of carry it forward, doesn't it? It's something that our religion teaches us. If you want to make a change in the world, then you make a change at home and then make a change within yourself and eventually you impact the world. Something any climate activist will tell you. We can't necessarily stop companies from making cars or people from mass producing in factories or cows from farting, but what we can do is stop and perhaps recycle that ASOS package that we ordered on payday that we're going to inevitably regret on the 20th of the month when we realise we've got £40 left in 10 days. And we've all been there. Many of these quotes are things that they just feel so true. Give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, eat for a lifetime. Wow, so true. There's many others. My point is, is that in a complete 180 from my previous self and to prove that you can be wrong, I'm going to be basing my talk today off cliches that I've either read or that have been said to me through these episodes and I'll be explaining how guests of mine have related to those cliches and how they've changed my perception 
improved my thinking and inevitably improved my life in some ways. Some of the things I'm going to mention to you guys today genuinely changed my life. It genuinely made me a better person and I believe maybe a better family man. I believe made me better in the professional world and I believe some of them even made me better spiritually. So I'm hoping that's what you guys can take from it as well. I'm not only going to be sharing lessons though, we're also going to be playing the Freshly Grounded game. Who here has got or has played the Freshly Grounded game? Fine, good. Those of you who haven't, you're in luck because we're selling it today, just outside the stage. But also we'll be playing it today with all of you guys. You guys would have got a ticket number. When you got a ticket, if you don't know your ticket number, you can check on your QR code. Underneath the ticket, there's a number underneath the QR code. I'm going to be randomly picking a number between 0 and 100 and whoever it lands on will be answering the question. A bit of audience participation. Everybody seems nervous now. Nobody's going to be filmed, however, when you answer a question, you'll be given a mic and your audio will be recorded. So if anybody has an issue with their audio going out in next week's episode, because this is going to come out next week, at the end of the show, just grab anybody with Freshly Grounded Branding, let them know your name and what you mentioned, and we'll make sure we cut it out. Also, don't be that guy. No, I'm joking, you can if you want. Uh, fine, so, so that's pretty much it. So we can get started with lesson number one. So lesson number one. Be yourself. Everybody else is taken. Yes, I've started with the cheesiest quote of them all. What you guys will notice through various episodes of Freshly Grounded is, is that often we have guests who have gone through some sort of growth, some sort of change in their life. And more often than not, that change has led to success. It's been a successful change. After hundreds and hundreds of questions to various different people, I started to notice a pattern within these individuals. Within those who made a change and they became extremely successful, I noticed something between every single one of them. And what that thing was, is that they had to become their true, authentic self. They had to become their true, authentic self, not because they wanted to, but because they needed to. It's because that's how they were created. That's how you're created. That's how I'm created. We've all got these nuances, these characteristics, talents, you can call them, gifts. These gifts that we have, we should embody them. We should use them to our advantage. Become your true authentic self. It doesn't mean you can't work on your flaws. Of course you should work on your flaws. That's why an author, Philip Pullman, he said, you cannot change who you are, only what you do. It's very true. There's another cliche for you. You cannot change who you are, only what you do. However, with that being said, working on the advantages that you have and being as true to yourself as possible will be your biggest advantage in life. I interviewed a psychologist, his name was Jamil Qureshi. Has anybody seen the Jamil Qureshi episode of Freshly Grounded? I'm seeing some hands. Jamil, for those of you guys who haven't, is a psychologist but he's not any psychologist. He's one of the top psychologists in the world. He's sat with and trained some of the world's leading athletes. In fact, five of the athletes that Jamil has trained have become number one athletes in the world. Jamil said that through the teams that he coached, his various sports teams, the ones that focused on their strengths became successful and the ones who focused on their weaknesses generally did not. Because when you're putting all of your effort on the thing that you're weak at, you're just going to move it up slightly. Whereas if you focus on the thing that you're already good at and that you love, you're going to excel. You're going to improve that so much faster, you're going to enjoy improving that. An example of somebody who we interviewed early on, who embodies being your true authentic self, was Moeen Ali. Moeen Ali is an England cricketer who's made it to the pinnacle of his career, despite the fact that he probably shouldn't have. Here's a guy who didn't necessarily attend all of the team uh, occasions because they, some of them went against his morals. He would stand up against oppression. 
and often that would lead to being in trouble and risking his career. And he would take on fines so that he didn't have to wear sponsors that were unethical. Sounds like a very difficult man for the cricket organisation, if that's what they're called. Yet, he captained, his he captained his team for England on the international stage. He still performs at such a high level today. He's always trending on Twitter when he's playing. That's how I see success. But he did it because he remained his true authentic self, despite it feeling like it's probably not the right thing to do, but knowing that he can't change himself. He became successful. He became so good that they couldn't ignore him. So that's lesson one. Be yourself. Everybody else is taken. Now we're going to play the game. I hope you guys are ready. Lesson number two. If you want to live a top shelf life, you have to stand on the books that you've read. This is a quote by Jim Rohn that I had to learn and implement very early in Freshly Grounded. I'm not much of a reader, I'll be honest. Does anybody remember The Secret Seven or The Famous Five? You read them in like year five and year six. Up until a few years ago, that was probably the most recent book I remember reading. I went through university, I went through my A-levels, doing well, without reading any books. I remember in, in GCSEs, we had to, in GCSE English Lit, we had to do To Kill a Mockingbird. We had to write an entire essay on To Kill a Mockingbird, live in the exam, no prep. All we had to have done is read the book. I watched the movie. <laughs> I got an A. Now my philosophy's kind of changed. I realised that in order to have conversation, with different types of people, which we should all want to do to network, I had to read. To do anything, to really become successful in anything, we have to study and we have to read. In order to live a top shelf life, you have to stand on the books that you've read. You know, one of the advantages of running Freshly Grounded is that I get to expand my network really fast. And there's one guy who I met through Freshly Grounded, I'll keep him anonymous, but he's a CEO of one of the UK's largest online retailers. It's not ASOS, I've mentioned them already. Huge. He's never been on a podcast, but I met him through Freshly Grounded. I was very lucky, he kind of took me under his wing. He, we went for a, a coffee once and he kind of told me how things work and I was asking him questions. And then one time he called me and he said, Faze, why don't you come down and see the operation, see how things work at the HQ? Of course, I said. Got in their car, drove four hours, booked a hotel the night before to make sure I was early the next day, got there. He showed me everything, it was amazing. He let me in, a window of how a multi-million pound online company works. It was stunning. He showed me how things are automated, hundreds and thousands of orders just printing automatically from their industrial printers. Then he took me to the, to the room where they send the packages off. Shows me how they get thousands of packages on a daily basis to America, all around the world. Then he took me to the stock room where they keep their stock. Generally what a stock room is used for. He said, Faisal, we keep the most popular items on the middle shelf, eye line, so they're easy to grab. These are the things that people buy the most. These are the most popular items, people can grab them quickly package them and we can send them off. That's how we keep things fast. You'll also notice in supermarkets, go to Asda, Tesco, Sainsbury's, if you go to the, uh, the cereal department, you'll see Weetabix on your eye line, you'll see Quaker Oats, you'll see Frosties, Cheerios. And on the bottom shelf, you, where I generally shop, you'll see not Weetabix, but Wheat Bisques. You won't see Frosties, you see Frosted Flakes. You won't see Cocoa Pops, Choco rice. They're fine, they taste the same. That's where you find me generally. And on the top shelf, you find the things that are less popular, people don't really buy as often, but they're more expensive, they're higher value. Only a short percentage of people buy those, but there is a market for them. That's the top shelf. If you want to live a top shelf life, you have to stand on the books that you have read. This was embodied in episode 190 of Freshly Grounded, when I did an interview with a brother called Muhammad Abdurrahman. Muhammad Abdurrahman was a man who wanted to go to Cambridge University, the epitome of a top shelf life. 
Sadly, he didn't get in. He didn't get in, but there's always a but. He kind of underachieved in his A-levels for, 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 for one reason or another, a very intelligent man. He got into another university, which was also a great university, by the way. When he didn't get into Cambridge, which was his goal, what he decided to do was, of course, make du'a, but get his head in the books and study. And then once he finished his degree, he applied to Cambridge for postgrad. Not only did he get accepted into Cambridge, but he got accepted on a free, paid-for scholarship. They paid for everything. He got his head in the books, he started reading, increased his knowledge, and he fought for his way. If you want to live a top shelf life, you have to stand on the books that you've read. That is lesson number two. Now point number three is one. This is the first of the points that I've, that I've mentioned that genuinely changed my life. Lesson three is about decision making. When I heard this thing, I started implementing it straight away. When I started implementing it straight away, I saw changes in my life instantly. Great changes. I'm bad at making decisions, notoriously. Ask anyone in my family. I can't choose between spicy rice or peri chips at Nando's. I'm a mess. Is anybody else here bad at making decisions, whether they're big decisions or, large, or, or small decisions? I've, there's one sister who's bad at making decisions here. I don't believe that out of 100 people, there's two of us who struggle a bit with decision making. Is there anybody else who struggles with decision making? Oh, we've got another one. Right, two, there's three of us. There's four of us. This is for you four. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, I interviewed Jamil Kreshi. Jamil, as I said, has, has worked with some of the top, has worked, is a psychologist who worked with some of the top athletes in the world. I said to him, I said, Jamil, I need to be selfish here. I want to ask you a question about me. I struggle to make decisions. Can't make a decision. Spicy rice, peri chips. I said, give me something. Something that will help me make decisions. And this is the thing that changed my perception on everything. He said, Faisal, well, first of all, he said, I never thought I'd be advising someone on spicy rice peri chips. After that, he said, Faisal, it's not about the decisions you make. It's about committing to those decisions. He said, people come to me all the time and they say, Jamil, I don't know whether to go to university or, go, or just start work straight away. He says, you can be successful in both. But it's about committing to the decision you make. So often... We finally make a decision after weighing out the pros and cons. And then the grass is always green on the other side. We're so busy after we made that decision, thinking, what if I made the other decision? We're not fully committed to that decision. If you want to be successful, after making a decision, stick to the decision. We have to commit to the decisions that we make. It's not about making a decision. It's about committing to those decisions. That is a lesson from Jamil Kreshi. This is my last one from Jamil Kreshi. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a bit uh, different. I'm going to mix it up. That was lesson three. We'll move on to point number four. Point number four. A person's name to that person is the sweetest sound in any language. This is a lesson from Dale Carnegie's famous book, how to win friends and influence people. Now, of course, I didn't get that quote from Dale Carnegie directly. I think that ship sailed when he died in 1955. But it's changed how I conversate drastically. By using people's names, Harun, you get their attention. Also, by using people's names, they listen to you and they like you. Don't get any ideas, brothers. <laughs> they like you more. But it's hard to use people's names, hard to remember people's names. I, for one, forget how to use people's names. If you start using their names in conversation, it's a great conversation hack to get people to like you. A technique that I use, that I think Dave actually spoke about in his book, is repetition. I'll show you guys how it works. So somebody, come, you see somebody, hi, my name's Faisal, what's your name? Khalid, lovely to meet you, Khalid. How was your day today, Khalid? 
Oh, lovely. Well, Khalid, I'll see you later. You've already said their name three times. Let me pick a number at random. I'm going to keep picking a number at random until someone puts their hand up. Is anybody ticket number 24 again? This is a bit biased. 24. I don't think we already went through that and there was nobody. Let's, number 66, 87. 87. Do we have an 87? I think we have a hand up. 87. What's your name? Can you what? Sorry? Wiley. Wiley. Lovely to meet you, Wiley. How was your journey here today? And Wiley, did you come in public transport or did you come by car? You came by car. Mm, lovely. Luxurious. Came central London in a car. I'm going to pick another number, Wiley. Number, number 15. Do you have a number 15? Do you have a number 15? Number 15, yeah? Wiley, I want you to ask number 15. Sorry? Wally. Wally. I was thinking, why are you like. <laughs> I thought you got arrested a few weeks ago or something. I was going with it. This is not a great task for trying to talk. I'm talking about names here. Wally. Okay. Like a whirly, like to get married. Okay. Not you, obviously. Uh, whirly, I want you to ask number 15 his name. And, and when he tells you his name, I want you to repeat his name back to him. Can you do that for me? Harris, Whirly, Whirly, uh, Faisal. We all know each other now. I'm going to come back to you guys at the end of the talk, and hopefully you'll remember each other's names because we repeated them. A bit of repetition. Remember, the, remember everyone's names. Yeah, Harris, Whirly. I still feel like I'm saying it wrong, but we're going to go with it. We're going to remember that. That is lesson four. Lesson four is a person's name to that person is the sweetest sound in any language. Was that lesson three or four? Three. That was four. <laughs> it's written down. <laughs> lesson five. Lesson five also really impacted me. I know I just said this about lesson three, which was the decision-making one. But three and five are my top ones. Lesson five is about taking the next step, right? It's about how to overcome feeling overwhelmed. There's an episode of the podcast that I did with a guy called Ricky Nuttall. Anybody see the Ricky Nuttall episode? Two people. Now, I'm starting to wonder if you guys are actually freshly grand audience members. <laughs> Tickets sold out in two days, so I thought, oh, these guys are hardcore fans. Asking about episodes, you guys have skipped one or two. Don't worry, I'm going to brief you. I was prepared for it. So Ricky Nuttall, you have to watch this episode. Ricky Nuttall was one of the 250 firefighters who attended Grenfell Tower. A day that all of us remember being in London and one that I'm sure affected many of us, or at least some of our friends and family, in a really personal way. Ricky dealt with a lot of PTSD after, he had to go for therapy, but he managed to eventually get back on his feet. He had suicidal thoughts, managed to eventually get back on his feet. I said to Ricky, Ricky, what do you do when you're feeling overwhelmed? You've got a big task, it feels like a mountain. How do you overcome that? I'm sure that's a problem that a lot of us have faced, right? Ricky said, Faisal, I've read a book. It's called The Horse, the Boy, the Fox and the Mole. And he said it's written like a children's book. It's like an illustration book. But actually, it's for adults. And they use it in leadership meetings to teach. And he said there's a part in the book in which there's a boy and a horse and in the forest. And the boy says to the horse, I can't see where I'm going. And the horse says, well, do you see your next step? The boy says, yes. The horse says, well, then just take that. Just take that. Sometimes we feel so overwhelmed by the task that we have that we forget 
that you only have to focus on the next step sometimes. Just take the next step. There's a reason why people often speak about ladders in like motivational talks and about how the rungs or the steps of a ladder are so important because you can't get from the bottom to the top without using the steps. It's true. So next time you feel overwhelmed, remember the episode with Ricky, you too. Everyone else watched the episode with Ricky. And then remember what he said. Sometimes, just take the next step. That's five points, the five lessons. What was anybody's favorite lesson out of those five so far? Do we have a favorite? You can shout out. You're a very quiet audience today. Name. Using people, great. Both of you guys said that, wow. Taking the first step. Taking the first step. Number three. You don't even remember the point. <laughs> three? Number three was uh, decisions, sticking to your decisions, yeah. That's my favorite too. Lesson number six was from one of my favorite guests. I think I may have already said that five times on the other points. This man, I kind of seem like a mentor. He's an amazing public speaker. I've had many private conversations with him that have left me floored by his intellect, by his confidence, his self-awareness, his ability to lead, Hamza Zortis. We've had Hamza on the podcast, I think twice now. And I've had countless interactions with him off screen. Hamza said, he said, don't live your present by looking at your future through the lens of your past. Very articulate. Don't live your present by looking at your future through the lens of your past. What he means here, obviously, is that we have very limited experiences in life. I'm only 27. I can see there's people here younger than me. I can see there's people here older than me. Thanks for coming out, Dad. <laughs> only slightly older than me. The point is, is that we've only lived so much, right? If we based everything we did, or everything we want to do, on the experiences on our past, then our goals for our future would be incredibly limited. We have to, to some extent, dream. We must dream. And that's what Hamza talks about. You have to be able to look at others and say, that's achievable for me. Or, don't look at anyone, just blue sky thinking, think of something something you want to achieve, a place you want to go, and say, well, of course. Of course I can, why not? Just whatever you do, don't limit yourself by looking at your future only through the lens of your past. <clears throat> a person who's done this immaculately, Arnout Dan Juma. We've interviewed him twice now on the podcast, Specially Grounded. Dan Juma is a professional footballer. But a lot of you may not know his story. I've been lucky enough to go for dinners and coffees and ask him about his life. What I found out is that Dan Juma's had a life of hardship. In fact, he's a secret that I think nobody knows. If you watch any of his matches, you'll notice that he does the snake celebration. I know you've clocked the snake celebration. Do you know why he does snake celebration? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you now. Tell all of you. But this one's for you, Zach. He does that celebration because he has a friend. And that friend, when they were growing up, they used to play football together. That friend, they used to call him the snake. Because he used to just, like, you know, get in and I don't know how football works. You know, he used to be snaky. He's a slither, you know, between the plays and stuff. But that's not the point. They called him the snake. This friend, after their matches, would... Uh, buy Dan Juma his food and so in dedication to him he was there for him when he had nothing he celebrates by doing the snake what an amazing heartwarming story but anyway we're talking about the point here about not looking at the future through the lens of your past so this was Dan Juma's past and if he just lived his life 
with a lens of the past, knowing that life can be tough and hard, and knowing that his parents had it rough sometimes, maybe he wouldn't have dreamed. Maybe he wouldn't have dreamed. A few weeks ago, Dan Juma got signed to Villarreal, one of the best teams in the Spanish league, for 25 million euros. He dreamed. In fact, in a few days' time, he's coming back to the UK. He's going to be playing Man United. He's going to be playing against Ronaldo. I'll let you guys into a secret that nobody yet knows. But this is airing after the event, so after the match, so it's safe to say. BT Sport flew over to Spain. They did a big interview with him. They're going to feature him 10 minutes before the match. It's going to be Ronaldo versus Dan Juma. Can you believe that? He dared to dream. Look at where he ended up. Don't forget to dream. Lesson number six. Don't live your present looking at your future through the lens of your past. Lesson number seven. Whether I was a shelf stacker in Tesco or a minicab driver, I will do everything to the best of my ability. That sound familiar, Mum? You know where that quote's from? Who? Uh, That's right, my mum's older brother, Rahman. He says that everywhere. It's his thing. But it's true. I interviewed Rahman. Rahman he works at the world's most profitable company or something like that as the executive something, something. Uh, the point is, he's got a good job, he's got a very good job in a very good company. And Rahman taught us some of his life values. One being that he understood that life is a game of inches. It's the small things we do that impact us. It's being attentive to everything, even if you're in a position that you don't currently want to be in. Even if you're doing a mundane, boring task. How often do we do our mundane, boring task half-hearted? I know I do. But he says, if you stick to your morals, and if you do even those tasks to the best of your ability, that's where you'll find success. So he gave me an example. He said, when I was a shelf stacker in Tesco, I was the best shelf stacker in Tesco. He said, when I was a minicab driver, all the other minicab drivers would just come as they are. It's minicabbing, it's not chauffeuring. They'd come as they are, dressed in whatever they want to be dressed in. They'd turn up outside the house, they'd honk the horn, and that's it. Not Rahman. Not the Rahman we know. <laughs> he would turn up to work every day in a suit. He'd drive his car, he'd make sure his car was clean, make sure you have tissues for the guest, for the, uh, for the passenger. I'm starting to question why actually now. And then when he got to the house, he'd knock on the door. Good morning, madam. I'm Rahman, your driver. <coughs> I'll be waiting outside in the car. Take your time. Whenever you're ready, I'll be waiting for you. Then he'd go back to his car and sit down. That is understanding that life is a game of inches. That is understanding that it's the little things you do. The things that we forget about. Earlier we spoke about uh, Ronaldo, we mentioned him. Who heard the story uh, this week about uh, the, the pudding saga? Crazy, right? For those of you guys who haven't heard it, I'll quickly explain to you, I'm probably not going to do it justice. I only read it in a tweet. Something like this. A few weeks ago, there was a, a leak, right, of the food that uh, the Man United players uh, order in their catering. These guys are the top of the top. The, 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 the first team for Manchester United, arguably the most well-known and famous team in the world. And some of them were ordering apple pie and custard and all these different desserts and fried foods. And so then it became a whole big thing, right? Everyone was talking about it, how can they be ordering this and uh, kind of mocking them and stuff like that. That was just a few weeks ago. Then Ronaldo signed to Man United. Now, Ronaldo is known as a man who understands that life is a game of inches. 
There's actually a motivational speech in a movie clip that Al Pacino uh, delivered. I've never seen the movie, but I've seen the clip. And he, he says this, he says, life's a game of inches. I think it was maybe a true story. It was like uh, their team were facing another team and then they were bound to lose. Anyway, they won, right, based on that philosophy. Ronaldo is renowned for that. He's known to be a guy who focuses on the little things. He's incredibly disciplined. Because of that, he takes care of everything kind of individually, right? And so his dessert, he will never have dessert. And so when he signed to Man United in the first day or one of the first days that they went there to catering, he went and he didn't get a dessert. Do you know what the effect of that was? Nobody got dessert. Because when Alden didn't get dessert, so nobody got dessert. That's the impact that you can have when you live like that, when you understand that life is a game of inches. Like Rahman, you can go from a cab driver to working for the most profitable company in the world. Like Ronaldo, you can go from wherever he started to wherever he is. I don't know much about Ronaldo. But I know that he's not doing too shabby. That is lesson number seven. Lesson number seven was, life is a game of inches. Master the small things. That's how you be successful. In fact, actually, Rahman gave us a bonus uh, little gem in that episode, which I'll mention. He said that, Everybody goes through peaks and troughs. We all have hard days. But it's not about having a dip. It's about how fast you can come out of it. It's okay to have a dip, but it's about how fast you come out of the dip. He said some people, something bad happens to them. Earlier today, I lost my script. Genuinely, I lost this piece of paper. I'll tell you the story. I, went, I put these in my camera bag when I left the hotel. Right at the top of the camera bag. I gave the camera bag to the camera crew. Camera bag, camera crew. Seems like the right thing to do. The camera crew were in the camera bag. And I was looking in the camera bag and I said, oh, my script was here. It's the only version that I have. It was right here. Camera crew said, I said, have you seen the cards? Camera crew said, we're looking for the cards as well. I said, without the cards, I don't think I'm going to be able to deliver the talk. I'm not feeling that prepared. I need to go over my notes. Camera crew said, we're looking for the cards. They said, we can't film without the cards. I'm getting confused. We can't film without the cards. Anyway, I ignored what they said. I went to my car, tried to look for the cards. Couldn't find the cards in the car, came back. I said to Kareem, Kareem's my, Kareem's my go-to. I said, Kareem, I don't have the cards. What are we going to do? Is there a printer here? Can we print the cards? Can we make new cards? Kareem's there trying to rush, find a printer. In the meantime, one of the cameramen comes up to me. I'll out him, Eamon, don't know where you are, can't see you. I know you're there somewhere. Eamon says, where did you put the SD cards? SD cards are the cards you put inside the camera. I said, Eamon, I'm not looking for the SD cards, I'm looking for presenting cards. He goes, oh. <laughs> I know where they are. I took them out. So uh, things can go wrong. And I dipped at that moment. I didn't know if I was going to come out of it, but alhamdulillah I did, because I had the cards. The point is, if you do go for a dip, try and come out of it fast. Lesson number eight from the podcast is a lesson that I learned from a book. When I was, reading, when I was doing the podcast, one of the books that I had read was Atomic Habits by James Clear, a very famous book, Atomic Habits, James Clear. James Clear says, we do not fall... We do, not, we do not rise, spoil it again, the next one's fall. He says we do not rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. We do not rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. He's talking about goal setting here, he says there's a big problem with goals. Everybody talks about setting goals, there's a massive problem with goals. He says the number one problem with goals is that winners and losers have the same goals. It's true, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I hear you guys say, it's true. Winners and losers have the same goals. So he says we should have systems. And I uh, thought, what better thing to do than explain to you a system that I have that I based off of this and, uh, and, and something that impacted my podcast greatly. So this one lesson is, I guess, uh, from me. You're welcome. 
<clears throat> so let's start by talking to you guys about a problem that I had with the podcast. The problem that I had with the podcast was I had to get, I promised myself, I had a goal to have a episode of the podcast every week, one episode a week. And I think you guys will know that for the most part, we managed to do that, right? I think I can only count on one hand um, how many times in the last six years we've missed an episode of the podcast every week. Now, that means I have to get a guest every week. And so the problem with that was that I had to often uh, cancel and move things about, right? I had to cancel and move things about because if I need a guest every week, I have to be, I have to submit to their availability because they're the ones who are giving me their time. So if a guest says Wednesday evening and I have something come Wednesday evening, I have to cancel. I can maybe say, can you do Thursday? But if they say, I've, I've only got Wednesday, Wednesday is. So, uh, so, so that was a problem, right? Not too bad, just move things about. When you get married, one thing cancelling your own plans, it's a whole other dangerous game when you cancel your wife's plans. It's a problem. It's going to cause arguments. So, then what happens? Then you have kids. Then you've got to cancel your kids' plans. Doctor's appointments, midwife appointments. It wasn't working. So I had to think of a solution. Okay, so I have the goal, the episode every week. Problem, cancelling plans. Solution was a system. The system that I set is me and my wife both have had iPhones. I set up an iPhone calendar. The iPhone calendar would input uh, what episode I had. I'd have an episode. Okay, next week we've got an episode Wednesday morning. That's now in the calendar. That instantly goes to her phone. Her phone gets a notification saying Faisal's got an uh, event next Wednesday. Let's say she's at the doctor appointment with, at the doctor's with Zachariah, and all of a sudden the doctor says, all of a sudden, uh, Oh, by the way, you're here, do you want an appointment? No. The doctor says, very uh, naturally, not shockingly, do you have, uh, uh, can, we, can, can we have an appointment for next Wednesday? Wife looks at the phone and she goes, oh, calendar says Faisal's got a podcast next Wednesday. Uh, can we do 11? Now, she probably wouldn't explain in that much detail. She'd probably just say, can we do 11? But the point is, is that I put it in, she's seen it, and then we've been able to stop an argument, essentially, really, haven't we? But I went one further than that. I ended up using a software called Calendly. I'd recommend it to all of you guys. Anyone who ever has to meet anybody, you should use Calendly. It's amazing. What Calendly did for me is I would then send my calendar out to my guests, potential people who want to be on the podcast. And they didn't see like, the details of what was happening, uh, but they would see that I have a blocked out time, right? And so they can only book the slots that I had available. And it works in real time. So if they select a slot, then it instantly gets blocked out for mine and my wife's calendars instantly. So now, now we can't book something. Likewise, if somebody's on there about to book an episode and then my wife adds something in, instantly that gets blocked out. Perfect. That's a system that we set in place. And now I don't rise to the level of my goals. I fall to the level of my system. Guys, if you don't have systems, start implementing them. Think about goals that you had, then the problem they're experiencing with that goal, and then eventually try and create a system for it. That is lesson number eight, one of the last two. Lesson nine, the penultimate lesson. Lesson nine is a quick one. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. This is a quote from a book that I've spoken about at nauseum on Freshly Grounded. Does anybody know what book this is from? Anybody? That's correct, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. It's a great book, a bit dodgy. You've got to be careful with it. But if you can read between the lines, great book, The Obstacle is the Way. What Ryan Holiday speaks about in The Obstacle is the Way is basically the idea that the things and the problems that we have Sometimes, it's about going through them. It's about looking at a problem and not saying, how do I solve this? It's how do I use this? Kind of like Qadr, accepting that this is the path that you've been put on. An episode that this reminds me of is an episode that I did with a gentleman named Sonny. Sonny's episode was very emotional. You'll notice in the episode that the whole time the camera was on him. We hardly switched to me. It's because I controlled the switch up. And I was crying. I was crying, Sunny was crying. You guys were probably crying when you watched it. It was a very, very emotional episode. Sunny talks about losing his daughter. Very, very young age, she was very ill. Huge obstacle. Obviously after grieving, Sunny decided to use that obstacle 
and he dedicated his life to charity. And now, he's probably impacted hundreds of children who have had a similar disease that his daughter had. Because he used it to fuel goodness. Amazing story. If any of you guys haven't seen the episode of Sunny, which by now I'm accepting there's probably most of you. Please do check it out. Amazing episode, amazing man. And someone who saw the obstacle and used it as his way. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. We have one last point left. Right guys, we're on the final point. Lesson number 10. Lesson number 10 is, I don't want avocado and quinoa, I want pizza. That's the lesson. Lesson number 10 comes from Adam Afghan. My funniest guest on Freshly Grounded, and funniest, I love Adam. I love the episodes with him. He's an absolute gem to be around. So much energy, so much happiness. And the point of the discussion was something useless. It was, we were talking about uh, healthy food options or something and, and that sometimes these healthy food options aren't the tastiest and sometimes you don't want av avocado and quinoa, you just want pizza and that's fine. The point though, the lesson in that is quite valuable. The lesson in that is sometimes, sometimes you know best. Sometimes, even though there might be long-term damage, in something, when you use it over time, there's not a huge long-term damage if you just have a slice of pizza, you know? Yeah, it's probably not great for your health, but it's not too bad for your mental health. A little pizza every now and again. The point is that sometimes you know what you want and you know what's good for you. Sometimes we seek too much reassurance from other people. That's not always ideal. I know I do it. I'm the worst at doing it. I ask everybody their opinion, then I make my decision. Everybody. I ask too many people. But sometimes I should listen to my gut. Henry Ford, the guy who literally invented mass production of automobiles, he said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. the guy who invented mass production of automobiles. Sometimes you know what's right. And it kind of relates to us in Fresh Uganda as well. We're 250 episodes in. This is the 250th episode. You guys have sat very patiently and listened to all of the value that hopefully I've been able to provide. I hope you guys got some value from it. And the truth is, is that we kind of just blagged our way here. 250 episodes in, 400 hours of conversation, six years, five years that we put into it. It wasn't always easy, and not everyone really understood it. I had to make a decision at one point to leave my job. It was only working in retail, but it was security. And I thought, I'm going to leave my job and start a podcast. At this point, podcasts weren't really a thing in the UK. And uh, alhamdulillah, I have very understanding parents. So I didn't feel any pressure from my parents. My parents say, do what you want to do, just apply yourself. But for mothers, you know, you feel like, am I doing the right thing? Leaving a job, starting this thing, similar situation to Rahel. And other things that we had when I started the podcast, like, for example, doing live events. We wanted to do live events, and I really didn't like how live events were done, right? I couldn't stand it, um, like, generally in our scene. I felt like every live event was like sticky wedding floors and not the greatest of venues. This is a house show, so cut us some slack. The idea of the house shows are smaller, quicker, faster, and so don't judge us. But when we said live events, we did our first live event in King's Cross Theatre, same theatre that Prince performed at. Then our next live events was London's West End. Many people were confused. Even I didn't know what I was doing, it just felt right. I just felt like our industry needed a bit of a makeover for some reason I thought I was the guy that was going to do it, just about pulled it off. The point is, is that if, if I didn't have that gut feeling, I didn't just listen to me, it might have been tough. People said to us, 
maybe live events aren't the right thing to do. Some people said to us, maybe we should do freshly grounded on the side. I wouldn't have been able to do things like this. Maybe it wouldn't have grown as much as it has, have amazing people like Zach and Adir, like Yusuf, like Kareem, like other Yusuf. Perhaps that wouldn't have been the case. Many people said to us many different things. But maybe not externally, but internally. Do you know what I said to them? I said, I don't want avocado and quinoa. I want pizza. Thank you very much. Like right, guys, if you turn the lights off a bit now. We bought pizza just for that bit. <laughs> That's stale and it's cold. All right, guys, look. We have the venue for a bit longer, but we've also gone over. We didn't prepare for this. We thought, if anything, we'd go under. But I'm a blab out. I'm looking at cream in the eye. I'm saying, are we doing a Q&A or not? If anybody has to catch the last train or something like that, I won't be offended. Otherwise, how long should we say? 10 minutes? 15 minutes? 20. 10 past 11, that would be. Is that okay? All right, we're going to do, do a Q&A. If anybody has any questions, throw your questions, hands in the air, and we can answer questions. It can be based around any of the episodes that we've done, about today's event, about the, the nitty-gritty, the business of Fresh Regarded, anything. We're here to answer questions. Raise your hand. Okay, we've got a question there. 